Hello, dental online trainers, and welcome to the Dental Online Training Sharecast. I'm your host, Dr. Dennis Hartley. Each month, we'll talk with dental experts who are doing amazing work in the world of dentistry. Also, occasionally, I'm going to throw in a few of my solo bonding sharecasts where I share a little with you about what I've learned along the way during my career. So tune in the first Tuesday of every month to hear the latest episodes. Hello, Dental Online Trainers. I'm Dr. Dennis Hartley, and welcome back for another Dental Online Training Sharecast episode. Today's guest is Dr. Jason Smithson, one of the most skilled, literally one of the most skilled cosmetic dentists in the world. If you're not familiar with Jason, yeah, probably ought to get underneath the rock that you've climbed under. No, just seriously, if you haven't seen Jason, you're not familiar with him. He is, in my opinion, one of the most impactful and greatest teachers of cosmetic, especially Uh, freehand composite dentistry in in the world today. I first learned of Jason through Dental Town. Remember Dental Town, Jason? I do, actually. That was my springboard. Yeah. And I tell you, it was kind of cool in the day, wasn't it? It was interesting. So if you're not familiar with Dental Town, and, you know, let me, let's go, we'll talk about Dental Town in a few minutes. Let me finish introducing (laughs) you. That'll get you Dental Town, because that's a story all into (laughs) itself. That's going to take a while. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, Jason practiced in Cornwall in the UK, right? In Cornwall. Uh, Jason has tons and tons of accolades. I think most impressive, he's on the uh, Spear faculty and he uh, teaches also, he's on faculty with Cosmonet. Uh, besides being just an incredible dentist and an incredible teacher, uh, Jason truly is one of the most enjoyable, enjoyable people just to hang out with. So for our ShareCast listeners, just kick back and listen in as Jason and I chat about his influences, his some reflections, and his journey in dentistry. All right, Jason, thanks for joining us. Hi, how are you? You well? I'm doing great. This has been a uh, a good start to 2023. I am. Uh, we have struggled through the COVID years. We lost 90% of our staff, and it took us 34 months to rebuild our staff. So it's been uh, it's been three years of really just slaving away. (laughs) Yeah. It brought me back to my early days in dentistry where I was cleaning rooms and seating patients and greeting people at the door. I mean, we literally were down to one, one full-time assistant who was running up front and and there's two dentists that are working. Um, We were, you know, hiring people who didn't show up. We were hiring people who lasted for a couple of days and then didn't return. It was, uh, it was some challenges. So we're finally, uh, finally getting back, you know, it's, it's different for sure. Um, what's, what's been like for you guys in the UK? Well, to be honest, um, we had the whole terror thing with the government with, you know, you had to wear a space suit and, you know, you had to have 10 different rooms to take various bits of clothing off and, you know, yep. you had to fill the ocean with as much plastic as you possibly could. Yeah, that was too. Other thing. But we're very rural. I mean, I, we uh, our office is 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 quite modern and, and kind of Scandinavian in look. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, the, the setting is a farm. So all the outbuildings of piggery and the old stables, they're the lab. But by definition, because it's rural and it's a farm, we, we have a low population density. So um, we didn't really get that much in terms of COVID, to be honest. Where people um, we did in the less... summer because a lot of people came down because we're a holiday area as well. Um, but generally, you know, in terms of staff, you know, you got the odd staff member down. But because we we weren't kind of overrun with people, it it kind of felt okay. Were people less stressed about it in general? I wasn't because I thought I was going to go broke. But... <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> did they close you know, down? Pre- I mean, did you have to shut down at all? Were you guys closed? Oh to, yeah, to we had to. We ha- well, I mean, my, as as you you know in in your introduction, my 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 business is uh, uh, dentistry, obviously drilling holes in people's teeth, which is three days a week. But the I would say two thirds of my income is is um, teaching at international conferences, which is a bit of a problem by definition of international, <laughs> yeah. no flying right. and conferences, people. So that. You know, I came home when we entered lockdown. I, I got a. I was in Australia, which is about a, as far away from home as you can get. No and um, I got a phone call from my wife saying, "Oh, there's a, this flu disease going around, and we're going to be shutting down quite soon. So you might want to think about coming home." 
And uh, I said, oh, no, it's just, it's not a big deal. And um, <laughs> you, well, you were so close. And, you were so close to it not being a big deal. Yeah, well, I literally, and this is no exaggeration, I literally got the last flight home. Oh, no kidding. What, when was that? Out what of, was the out date? Of Sydney, Australia. Now, there are, there are worse places to spend three or four months than Sydney, Australia, if anybody gets a chance to go to that beautiful city. But it could have been quite expensive. And I don't think my honorarium for three days of a lecture would have covered that. So <laughs> I would have been a little bit out of pocket. And yeah, and then came home and just had a couple of days at home. I, I normally have, if I fly back from Australia, I have a couple of days at home just to get my head together, get rid of the jet lag before I go back to the office. Sure. And uh, as I was sitting at home on the second day, I was literally watching my inbox stack up. This is no exaggeration. Over the next morning of just cancellations for the whole year, mm. this is in January. Wow. So like my whole business was just wiped out for the whole year in the space of a morning. Yeah. Uh, we both we both teach and we both t travel around teaching. So, you know, you know, you get probably maybe once a month, you might get a cancellation. Then on, on, on the other end of it, you might get somebody requesting a similar date. Sure. So it kind yeah. of levels out and that's kind of normal. But to get literally like 40 cancellations in a morning, that screws with your head a lot. No doubt. And I was like, shit. Um, and then we had a discussion about the office and we were like, are we going to need to close the office? And then then that was taken out of our hands. The government closed the office. Mm -hmm. um, so I never actually got back to work from Australia. And then the, the next time I got back to work was kind of like this. I'm exaggerating. It was, I think, it was, no, I'm not actually. It was the end of, end of January. I came back from Australia and they shut the office until June. Yeah. That's crazy. So isn't it? that was it. And um, I guess uh, for me, it was like the first week I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just going to be for a couple of three weeks and it's yeah. going to be cool. And, you know, it's fine. Well, I said to my wife, I just t treat it as like a holiday and, you know, Right. We'll just take our vacation early. This is how we look at it hmm. on a positive. And then after about two or three weeks, I was like, man, we better start shopping at the cheap stores. <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah. If there's anything left yeah. in, the, in the cupboards there. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and then I had, then I had this kind of, because I have two children in school, you know, I have, a mortgage, you know, right. I have life to pay for and stuff like that. I was like, oh, this is not good. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, okay. I've got no income. And actually, two thirds of my business is wrecked until the following year. Um, if you're lucky, right? If I'm lucky, and I'm like, yeah. and then I, then the sort of things start going through your head, like, Mm, we might have to take the kids out of school, we might have to sell the house, this kind of thing, if this yeah. is going to go on for like a year. You know, yeah. so I had about two or three weeks of that and then, you know, just going crazy. And then uh, I got my head together and um, I personally had been very resistant to doing online stuff. Yeah, I'm my favorite thing to do is live workshops for sure. Yep, um, live in person somewhere between 15 and 30 delegates. That's my absolute favorite thing to do yeah i don't mind doing a big podium i did a podium lecture last week in south africa i i, I don't mind doing that but my love is live workshops and I'd, i and and people had asked me to do webinars and my business partner i have a business partner in scotland we do a lot of work together uh in the uk and he tried to get me to do webinars and i was like i'm not doing that i don't like the medium I don't like, I don't like the fact that I can't, that I can't see the whites of people's eyes. Yeah, sure. And I all, from a commercial point of view, I thought, you know what, it's kind of like giving stuff away. Um, so my business partner said to me, look, we got to do something. Let's, let's run some, let's run a few webinars and, 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 Initially, we did them to compensate for the classes that we couldn't run. Sure. Just to keep people interested, really. Yep. And then he was like, uh, 
he was a driver really and and he said uh, maybe we should charge for these and we did and actually what what happened is we we had the best year we've had in the last 10 interesting so we had the highest revenue the highest net profit year just on webinars no live stuff because we did in total over over covid 140 hours of of of, of live education which was then recorded yeah and actually i'm still doing webinars but i think people are a bit webinared out after covid i think it'll come back but i think probably they kind of had enough after covid but what we did for our live classes is now we've completely eliminated the lecture from our live class yeah and just get right to so the answer. what we've done is we've taken uh the webinars we recorded I I during covid let's say for example the class four so typically our class four class was somebody would come to our class and spend the first session an hour and a half two hours listening to me lecture on the class right. four and then the rest of the session for the rest of the day doing it hands on and now what we do is we give them the recording a month before the lecture but also we did some live demos as well sure also a live demo so they could see so then they turn up to the class and just do six to eight hours of hands-on and then we let them keep the recording for a month or two afterwards just sure. to revise it and ask questions mm -hmm. so actually for me from that early beginnings of let's call it just sheer terror yeah, absolutely. Um, both professionally, like, have I even got a career left? Because mm -hmm. as a dentist, I mean, oh yeah, I went through the same fears. Absolutely. You know, you're you're a, if you're a dentist or an ENT surgeon, that's just not where you want to be in a COVID epidemic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and from a financial situation, it's it turned out really well, and actually, um, it's made me think in a completely different way about education. You know, I used to kind of like giving a lecture at the beginning of the hands-on. It kind of used to loosen me up and get me kind of connected with the audience. Yeah. But then I started to think, you know, if I were a delegate, is this what I want? You know, this this I can watch in the comfort of my own home in little steps. And if I miss a bit, I can go back and have a look at it. Yep. Um, you know, if I'm spending time out of my office and I'm buying a hotel and I'm buying travel and blah, 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 would I really just like to spend six or eight hours doing hands-on? And that's, that's what we've started to do. Um, well, all our, all our English courses, or no, all our UK courses are based on that model now. And it's been super successful. People are doing workshops. They want to get the hands-on experience, right? Yeah. So if you can facilitate their knowledge, prior to doing the hands-on and you know that's sort of where, how we came up with dental online trainings we wanted people to get better prepared for when they do live workshops yeah so we we were never looking at replacing live workshops we wanted people to have the understanding the knowledge of the science the arts the layering techniques so that when they go in and do workshops live hands-on workshops they're better prepared and it sounds like that's exactly what you're trying to do it's it's exactly the same now i was pre-covid i was really quite Luddite and a bit backward um, in so much as I thought, okay, well, if I do, if I do stuff virtually, they won't want to come to my hands-on workshops. No, it's just the opposite. And, and in fact, the exact opposite. And yeah. actually we've gone one step further because we've blended the two. Mm -hmm. It's just such a nice model now. And, and, I, and I, I would say I've gone from a position of enjoying doing the live workshops a lot to actually enjoying doing it even more yeah because i haven't got it i don't know about you i find a lecture the hardest bit um well because i think you connect differently with a lecture than when you do yeah. when you're doing hands-on right i mean that's yeah. that's why i mean for me why i teach is because i love sharing and i love connecting with uh, with the participants and when you're when you're lecturing then you're just sort of you know you're you're giving your spiel but when you're doing hands-on then you're connecting right there's yeah. Right. You're, 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 I think when you're, when you're doing the workshop for me, there, I'm, I'm doing the procedure and I'm thinking as I'm talking, as I'm doing, 
Yeah. But when you're presenting, you're just showing the stuff that you did and you're talking about it. It's just so very different. No? Yeah. And also when you present, you've kind of got to look at the room. Well, this is what I do anyway. I look at the room, I read the room and I kind of work out what level everybody's at. And then mm -hmm. I pitch in the middle. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, for sure. Right. So I'm hopefully curve. pleasing everybody, but the reality is you're probably a little racing on a little bit for some less experienced people. And yep. you're probably, let's be honest, boring some of the more experienced people. Sure. So you're only pitching to the middle of the room, really. Whereas if they have the ability to uh, watch watch your video, they can do they can do anything at whatever pace. Yeah. You know, because you're going around the room um, and you're working one to one. I just had a uh, conversation yesterday with a young prosthodontist just graduated from UT. And he, in his, his little speech, he thanked his parents and then he thanked YouTube to help him with his, uh, with his dentistry. And I think that's the reality of the world we're in is not that you can't do it in person, but we, I think we've just become a world where we understand we can have some knowledge facilitated through other mediums, like either pre-recorded or even live. I want to pivot. And as you, as we pivoted about from in-person and online stuff, so I want to, you know, the purpose of these sharecasts is my, my goal is to try and, uh, I don't know if motivate, I, maybe influence, maybe support dentists who are either young dentists who are just getting out in it, or even more experienced dentists that are sort of like struggling with the day to day. And I, I'll, so I'll tell you a story. So when I was a young dentist, I used to go to the Restorative Academy, the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry that's in Chicago every year coming up next week. And are you are you are you on the are you on the program? I'm afraid so. Yeah, I thought so, right? I was gonna to talk to you about that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so someone on this uh on this podcast may have been influenced on getting you on that program. Uh so uh I used to go when I was a young dentist, and it used to be at the Drake Hotel in downtown Chicago. And mm -hmm. at the Drake, they had a bar down in the basement called the, the Cork Door, the Golden Rooster. Mm -hmm. And my buddy and I, we'd go into the Drake and we'd sit over in the corner and we'd be looking at all of these dignitaries in dentistry, you know, the Frank Spears and Dawson and, you know, all these, um, you know, amazing, incredible dentists, mm -hmm. right? And we'd be just drinking our beer and we'd be just watching and, oh my God, there's whoever. And then as I've sort of gotten older, I've come to realize that, you know what? all these dentists are just people, right? They're just dentists, right? And yep. and make, what separates them is not that they have this incredible skill that they were born with. They weren't blessed by, you know, by some divine being. You know, what they were blessed with, I think, is just being persistent and working hard and, and being curious and wanting to learn more um, and just wanting to get better. And for a lot of them that were there, they wanted to share. They wanted to share what they learned from others and share what they learned. And I think that's what I, how this is sort of all sort of evolved with the Sharecast is I like to help other dentists understand that, you know, these dentists like Jason Smithson that you, that you see at Spear or that you've seen at any number of international presentations, you know, he's, you know, he's a family guy. He's got two kids, got a wife. He's a, he's a gardener. Um, <laughs> Right? Drinks too much wine. He drinks too much <laughs> wine, likes to have a little bit of fun, um, tells great stories. And so that's where I want to sort of talk about is first of all, I, I believe your dad's a dentist, correct? Nope. Oh no, I thought I, I thought we had talked about oh, that. I'm from a I'm from a super blue collar family. My dad worked in a factory, my mom worked in a grocery store. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at. I'm the kind of most of my family, other than my parents, are builders, so I'm kind of the weird one. You how'd know? you get? To, how'd you end up in dentistry? Oh, this is a super long story, but the, right. the, kind, got of, time. the kind of one hundred and one is um, I that you probably haven't seen it, but there was a. I, I'm from a place in the north of England called Yorkshire, which is kind of where the hills are and the wilds. And there was a, a TV series when I was young called, about a guy called James Herriot. I don't know if you've seen it in no, the US. Uh -uh. Okay, so it's set in the 40s and the 50s. So it's all very tweed jackets and very rural with sheep and cows and everything. Um, and he was the vet. So it's a series about this country vet, all right. James Herriot. It's called All Creatures Great and Small. 
And I was influenced from being about nine, and I decided I wanted to be a country vet. Okay. Um, and, you know, I just went to a regular school in a, in a fairly blue-collar area, but um, the head teacher recognized I was relatively bright. And, and, and most of the kids in my school were kind of going to school with a view to either working in a factory or going down the mine. That was a teacher. Yeah. That people did basically. sure if you, take, if you were super smart you maybe went and managed at a mine or worked in the office or something like that anyway the headmaster said to my parents this guy, this kid's pretty okay I, I think he could go to university now that's kind of a biggish deal yeah. um so my parents my parents were very supportive and they were like okay what do you want to do and i decided i wanted to be a vet mm -hmm based on watching this tv thing when i had no family uh, experience of being a vet or, or anything like that right and then when i was about 15 16 i went and worked in a vet just to get some experience just to see if, and i kind of liked it but um <laughs> when i got and i, and I was kind of geeky as a 15 year old kid like yeah. super bookworm uh -huh. super super bookworm mm -hmm. but when I hit 17, now in England, you do your A-levels, which are the entry exams for, for university. I don't know if I've told this uh, openly, actually, in a dental forum before, so this might be a first. Okay. Oh, I, nice. I, I, when, you, when you're 18 in the UK, you do your, you do your A-levels, and then on the basis of those grades, you, you go to university, college, if you will. Okay. And in the UK, because I know a lot of people listening to this are from the US, in the US, in the UK, you don't do a bachelor's degree first. You go straight in and do dentistry as a bachelor's right. degree, right? So anyway, I applied to do veterinary science, which was uh, a bachelor's degree also. And, and I was accepted by two colleges. So that's good. So far, so good. So far, so good. Yeah. And then uh, 17 years of age this um, bookish, geeky, dorky kid morphed into uh, a kid who liked to drink beer and chase girls in a fairly major way. <laughs> it's it's, 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 it's going to happen at some point. <laughs> yeah. So it was kind of fortunate it happened before college. But anyway, I flunked my... Well, I didn't flunk my A-levels. I just... I just didn't do as well as they expected. Okay. Now, in the UK at that time, it's not the case now because dentistry is the most difficult one to get into, but uh, in the UK at that time, veterinary science was the most difficult one to get into. God only knows why, but it was. Well, is it um, limited? Like in the US, it's so competitive because there's so few programs. Exactly. There were like yeah. five or six. Yeah. And then the next one was medicine. And then the next one after that was like dentistry. If you were kind of like a little bit challenged, you did dentistry. <laughs> so, so, so it's a dentistry's good, good fortune that you decided that you would start uh, learning well, to drink. No, and I didn't girls. decide anything. So I got my grades uh, and I came home. My, my dad, my dad left school at 15. He had no qualifications yeah. whatsoever. So he wasn't in a hugely good position to advise me academically but he was in terms of life and that was good because I came home and I said I, I, I'm not sure I'm going to get into vet veterinary school with these grades and he was like well we better go up to school and see so you have the advisor at school and uh, so I sat there and um, showed the advisor my grades Miss Reckersley he was called and uh, I remember still now some what 40 40 years later uh, no 35 years later. And I said, am I going to get into veterinary school with these grades? And he was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and then my dad said, okay, well, uh, can we see if we can get him into med school with this as a second choice? And he was like, not even close. Um, and then, so I said, uh, okay, will I get into dentistry? And they were like, I'm not sure about that either. And I said, okay, well, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a year off and I'm going to retake my my exams and see what I can do. And my dad looked at me and he was like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to, you did it. You're going to do the best with what you can. All right. Which I think is valid, you know. Yes. Um, it's school of hard knocks. In England uh, uh, and, well, the, in the UK, 
they have a process called clearing, which is where um, all the colleges who haven't got full subscription ah. advertise. And at that time, it was in the Sunday Times, which is kind of a fancy news. No way. Yeah, yeah. So there's a big list in the back. There, there isn't now. It's done digitally. Sure. But, um, there was a list on the back of the Sunday Times, and you just went through it like you were hunting for a job. Yeah, that's what I'm imagining. That's crazy. Yeah, it's it's crazy. And it would be like the location of the university, the subjects it had available, and the bare minimum grades you could get in with. No way. Right? So this was like where all the flunked kids would be looking through. So on the basis of that, you contacted the university and set yourself up with an interview and they interviewed you and they decided if you wanted you or not. I was looking down and I'm looking at biomedical science and biology and stuff. I'm thinking, what can I do with like my five science uh, A-levels? <laughs> and then I come down and it was like University of London, Queen Mary and Westfield, which is actually a very good university. Okay. One of the best, actually. Dentistry. And I was like, oh, man. And it was like ABB, which is what I had. Okay, right on. I was like, okay. Let's see if I can get an interview here. I just had the bare minimum. So I went and had the interview and they accepted me. And awesome. here we are. But it worked out, actually. They, they were quite smart because rather than um, most colleges just set their grades and then they accepted the students that got those grades, whereas... The college I went to, they did that for half the students, give or take. But the other half of the students, they picked up in clearing. Oh. And what they did is they picked up all the flunked vets and medics. Yeah, interesting. And it's a super smart way of yeah, dealing right. with things because um, what they were doing is picking up bright kids who'd flunked things for whatever reason. Right, right. Life reasons. There are things that Life happen. Life reasons, yeah, yeah. So they were actually ending up with actually brighter and more innovative people generally yeah yeah so except for um, you with yeah. exceptions yeah with exceptions so in our college and and this was really quite a cool place to go to college because most of the people there were not the really super geeky people who worked their asses off to get there right they were kind of bright people who Flunked in a way, yeah. So yeah. it was this kind of circus um, of people, and actually, I've reflected on this now. I was I was looking around all the people, uh, not all the people, but many of the people in my age group in the UK who are in fairly senior positions now, who are like professors here or uh, run bigger programs or or politically quite strong. Uh, from my college no interesting yeah real people right real people well it, it's it's like here's to the crazy ones really that's mm -hmm. basically what it was and that's how i got into the dentistry frankly it's a, just pure luck what do you think when you're going through it so i'm mean, the same way my dad was blue collar he was on the factory line at general motors building cadillacs we very blue collar when you got into the dental program what do you remember what, what were you thinking what was like <laughs> yeah so um that was interesting at college because and you'll get this because i i'm my dad worked in a glass factory but i guess kind of similar putting together glass yeah so not only was my college like this, it was also, um, it's what we call Russell Group. So it's a, it basically the equivalent in the US would be Ivy League. Okay. Right. So Russell Group's the English equivalent to Ivy League. So <laughs> I go to college and, and, and no disrespect, because I'm very friendly with people still from college, but they were from a different world. Yeah, for sure. No, I, mm -hmm. I went to college and I'll tell you this story, and this sounds terrible now in today's environment, but this is how it was. Um, I think there were 65 of us in our year, something like that. And in the first year, you lived in college. In other words, you, you the college had its own set of rooms. Okay, like a dormitory. Uh, like a dormitory, but you shared, there were just two of you in a shared bathroom. Okay. 
<laughs> and I can remember the college warden coming in because uh, she, she, the college warden was the person who, who, who ran the accommodation. And uh, a guy, guy I know called Lee, um, she came in and um, she said, oh, I put you two, get two guys together because you're, you're from the state school. The, um, yeah, interesting. That what would be called in the U.S. the public school. Public school, sure. Yeah, so basically we were the only two in the year from the public school. So it was like, okay. And that was day one. Yeah. And then uh, I turned up at that time. I had pretty long, well, I haven't got any hair now, but um, I had pretty long hair in dreadlocks. And I turned up with huge paratrooper boots on tight <laughs> jeans and a cure t-shirt and, uh, <laughs> and a very long cardigan. Yeah. <laughs> and I went to lectures and most other people were in tweed jackets and khakis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of where I was. And then I kind of looked around and, and I'm embarrassed to say, actually, and I think this is something of youth. I, I kind of morphed into that over time, over the next year. So a year or two later, I was in my jacket and my khakis. Uh -huh. um, and I regret that in a way. And now I guess as a 50 odd year old guy, I'm kind of going the other way back. Well, you know, it surprised me you say that because my in first influence with you was on Dentaltown, and uh -huh. for those who are younger, they're they're not familiar with Dentaltown, but essentially it was a it was a Facebook forum essentially that yep. dentists would present cases, and then through the anonymity of the internet, other dentists would sit there and just just crucify the uh -huh. dentistry that was presented, and <laughs> yeah. through the, you know hiding behind bad. their screen. <laughs> And I tell you, people were just ridiculously obnoxious and very, you know, over just, you know, whatever the case was. And I remember you specifically over because- wedging or something like that, something yeah, ridiculous. Something ridiculous, right? Yeah. And I remember you, you, you demonstrated some beautiful dentistry, but what I really loved is that you didn't take shit from anybody. Yeah. And you, so, so it doesn't surprise me that you would show up to class in your paratrooper boots and your cure t-shirt. Uh, because that's sort of how you came off is like, you know, screw you. This is why I did it. This is, this is what I did. And if you don't like it, go take a, go take a job. I don't care what you think. And I really appreciate about you because in that forum, um, I, that's not for me. I don't like that. I don't like that sort of confrontation. Um, but I always admired how you just sort of stood up for what you were doing and said, if you don't like it, go on some other forum. This is, this is what I'm doing, man. And but you presented your your evidence for what you were doing. I really appreciated that. I guess it, that kind of resilience came from that part of my life where I was just kind of nobody, nobody. I mean, a couple of my cousins had been to college, but not really Russell Group colleges. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, you know, I mean, members of my family have done well financially in the building trade and stuff, but I'm kind of the only let's to be snobbish about it the professional. So sure. um, it was quite overwhelming, I think, as a young person, as a 19, 20 year old guy who came from, like, I came from a, a mining village in a place called Yorkshire. And uh, well, I mentioned that before. And it was very blue collar, very white, we had the only non white person we had in my village was an Indian guy who was a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, and you were considered exotic if you were Catholic. Like it was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was super white, uh, very blue collar working class, and everybody was low church Protestant. And that was it. Yeah. So then I was dumped into central London. In, in, for, and this was good. Very cosmopolitan, multiracial. You know, I first time I'd spoken to people who weren't Church of England. First time I'd first time I'd spoken spoken to anybody non-white who yeah. was not the, the, my doctor. First time I'd been exposed to people of different social, well, higher social class, if you will. Sure, people who were wealth significantly wealthier than I was. You know, I was you know. I can remember in my second year, like going on a vacation with one of the kids and Mike and his, he, he was like, oh, oh, do you want to come on vacation with us? And I was like, yeah. 
And they were like, yeah, we're going to go sailing on our boat. <laughs> yeah, right. Different uh, world, isn't it? On a boat? <laughs> well, right. I didn't even have the kid, you know? I right. mean, now, you know, my if my kids, my son's skiing at the moment, so he has skiing here. It's not a big deal. Right. You know, he just, we just buy him a plane ticket and off he goes. Whereas, yeah. Like for me, if I'd have been, I wasn't invited to skiing, but if I'd been invited to skiing, I have to buy all the kit. Yeah. I just didn't have it. I didn't have the sailing kit, et cetera, et cetera. So it was like being, it was literally for me going to dental school was like being thrown, not in, even into another country, not even into another world, into a different universe. It was just, it was just like nothing I'd ever experienced. So it was yeah, it made me pretty resilient, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much for listening or viewing our ShareCast today. If you enjoy this and you want to get more information from Dental Online Training, then check us out at dothandson.com. That's one word, dothandson.com. Now, as a reminder, DOT has so many other great opportunities for your learning. We have our Wine and Unwind monthly webinars where we engage real time with our viewers as we bring in leaders throughout the dental industry to bring you up to date information and answer your questions. We have our monthly coffee and donut study club sessions where our participants bring in cases. And we treat and plan these cases together to help you bring great treatment to your patients. We have our live virtual workshops where our dental online trainers perform the same techniques from their kits as I'm doing from the comfort of their own home or office. We have our blogs and we have endless selection of our hands-on pre-recorded technique courses to help you improve the clinical dentistry that you can provide for your patients. That's right, with our on-demand courses, you do these hands-on exercises when the time is right for you. So check us out on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at Dental Online Training. And hey, be sure to share this with your friends and colleagues who you think might benefit from this ShareCast and everything that DOT has to offer. And now, how about one of those coveted five-star ratings? Please go to your site and help us by getting the word out to others. And we'd welcome one of those wonderful five-star ratings. This episode was created with special help from Claire O'Neill. It was edited by Ashley Dixon Ellison and with original music by Chris Peterson. Again, thank you for listening. I'm Dr. Dennis Hartley, yours for better dentistry.